Most cyclists think that their VO2 max is written in stone, like it's a number that's tattooed on your genetics or birth cert. You hear expressions like, well, I just don't have a big engine, but that's absolute nonsense. Your VO2 max, it's not a gift, it's a reflection. It's a reflection of your habits, your recovery, your stress, and your training structure. The truth is you can build world-class VO2 max, but only if you understand what's holding you back. Today, we're going to break down the seven fixable reasons your VO2 max might be low. And by the end, you'll have a roadmap for changing it. VO2 max is one of the key indicators for both performance and longevity. 87% of cyclists say they want to increase their VO2 max, but most have absolutely no idea how to actually do it. So if I was looking to optimize VO2 max today, this is exactly how I would build a world-class VO2 max step by step. Over the past few years on the Roadman podcast, I've interviewed some of the brightest minds in sport and professional cycling. Coaches, physiologists, world tour riders, and I kept hearing one thing over and over again. VO2 max isn't just about lungs or genetics. It's a system you can train if you understand the science. So in this video, I'm breaking down the science-backed steps to increase your VO2 max fast. This is everything I know about VO2 max put into a seven step framework so you can follow it and implement it. If you've been training for a few seasons, you've probably felt it. You start structured training, you see early gains like your FTP rises, your heart rate drops at a given power and your long rides just feel a little bit cruisier, smoother. Then one day, all this progress just stops. Weeks pass, months pass. You're still consistent with your training, but the numbers have flatlined. You convince yourself that maybe this is just your ceiling. Maybe this is as fit as you can get with your available training hours. But here's the thing, that plateau isn't the end of the road. It's the point where your aerobic base stops growing faster than your oxygen delivery system. What I mean by that is you've built endurance, but not capacity. You can ride long, but not fast. You can recover, but you can't reach those new levels of suffering because your body's oxygen network hasn't adapted. Imagine your body as a factory. Your VO2 max is how much oxygen that factory can process into usable energy. If one part of the chain, your lungs, your heart, your blood, your muscles underperforms, then the entire system bottlenecks. And most cyclists never fix that bottleneck because they don't even know where to look. Let's unpack VO2 max properly here. It stands for maximum oxygen uptake, how much oxygen your body can absorb and use during intense exercise. It's not just about how deep you can breathe. It's about how well you can use that oxygen once it's in your system. Think of it in three stages. You have the delivery stage. It's how much oxygen you can get from your lungs into your bloodstream. Then we have the transport stage, how effectively your heart and your blood vessels deliver to your muscles. And then we have the all important utilization stage. Like how effectively can your muscle cells, specifically your mitochondria, turn that oxygen into power out on the pedals. A limitation at any stage limits your VO2 max. So when you hear a pro rider on a podcast and he talks about having a VO2 max of 80, it's not because they won the genetic lottery or they were born with magic lungs. It's because every part of that chain is optimized through years of precise stress, recovery, and adaptation. Most amateurs train within this chain and not for the chain. They ride medium hard too often, like not easy enough for base training growth and not hard enough for VO2 max stimulus. And the body adapts to what it's asked to do. So when every session blurs this together, the signal becomes noise. To raise your VO2 max, you need extremes. You need long aerobic volume to expand your oxygen processing capacity, and you need short all out efforts to force that system to its breaking point so it rebuilds stronger. And that's the paradox of VO2 max. You build it by dancing between the easiest and the hardest of efforts. Everything in between is really just maintenance, not progress. Now, before I jump into the seven reasons, I wanted to flag a really cool project that we're kicking off at Roadman, and it's called Not Done Yet. Like the name suggests, it's for anybody who's not done yet. It's aimed at anybody who's over 30, who's not ready to give up. Someone who still wants to scratch that itch to see how good they can be, how fast they can be, even while balancing family, work, and life. And I'm going to personally work with a small number of athletes. I'm going to plan their training, their nutrition, their gym work, their race calendar, equipment selection, everything, like a full pro experience. So if you're looking at this and you're thinking, 
you know what, I'm not done yet. Take a second and pop me an email. It's just anthony at roadmancycling.com. Tell me a small little bit about yourself and why you think you'd be a cool fit for this program. Okay, so let's talk about the seven fixable reasons your VO2 max might be low and how to fix each one of these reasons. The first one is low training volume, poor mitochondrial density. Your mitochondria are your body's oxygen engines. When you ride in zone two consistently, you multiply those mitochondria, literally, you grow more engines inside your muscle cells. But most cyclists never ride long enough or often enough to see that adaptation. So the first fix is simple. Increase your total training volume by about 10 to 20%, mostly in the easy aerobic zones. It's not about going out the door and crushing yourself or half-wheeling your mates. It's about giving your body the oxygen exposure time it needs to evolve. Even an extra 90-minute endurance ride once a week or stretching your long ride by an extra 60 minutes It can shift your mitochondrial density within like eight weeks or so. The second reason, it's inconsistent high intensity work. You can't raise your VO2 max with base training alone. Your heart and capillaries, they need to be challenged near their limit. That means zone five work, three to five minute intervals at 90 to 95% of maximum heart rate. Most riders, they avoid these type efforts because honestly, they really hurt and they're brutally humbling, especially the first few times you do them. Every rider chases that feeling, the one where the bike just disappears, where the pedals turn easy and the road hums beneath you and for a few fleeting seconds, everything just clicks. No effort, no noise, just flow. That moment isn't luck, it's engineering. The kind that only comes from obsession. For over 20 years, Parley has refined the art of carbon. Every layer placed by hand, every angle tuned by feel and data until response, balance and speed exist in perfect harmony. You don't notice it partly because it's flashy. You notice it because it feels right. Because every input, every climb, every corner happens exactly how you imagined it would. Customer production, every frame goes through the same uncompromising process. Traceable, tested and finished by people who still believe craftsmanship matters. Parley doesn't chase trends, they chase that moment every rider lives for, when the bike and the body move as one. Parley cycles, engineered for that feeling that keeps us coming back. But they're the signal your body needs to build bigger oxygen delivery network. Two sessions per week is enough and if you're consistent your body adapts in as little as three weeks to this sort of stimulus. Consistency beats the heroics here though, every single time. The third reason, it's poor recovery and sleep. This one is simple, but it's devastating. If you train hard, but you only sleep six hours, you're sabotaging everything. During deep sleep, your growth hormone surges, tissue repairs, red blood cells regenerate. Miss that and your hemoglobin count drops, meaning your oxygen carrying capacity drops. So I would advise you to track your sleep cycles, protect your recovery days. If you need proof, listen to any of my podcasts with World Tour riders. The best riders in the world, they nap like it's their job because it is their job. Number four is iron deficiency or poor nutrition. Your body can't move oxygen around your body without iron. It's the central component of hemoglobin. Many cyclists, especially those who are training heavy, or particularly if you're living a plant-based lifestyle, they're chronically low on iron without even knowing it. And symptoms include like heavy fatigue, slow recovery, and importantly, lack of progression or adaptation to your training. Go and get a blood test. Ferritin levels below 30 is an automatic red flag. You can fix it with iron-rich foods or supplementation guided by your doctor. It's one of the easiest performance gains you'll ever find. Number five, lack of muscular efficiency. You can have the lungs of a world tour rider, but still waste oxygen if your movement is sloppy. Cycling economy, that's like how efficiently you convert energy into motion. That matters way more than people realize. Drills like low cadence climbing efforts or cadence specific sessions or off the bike strength work, they improve neuromuscular coordination. That means less energy lost per pedal stroke. Think of it as patching up leaks in your oxygen tank. Number six is over-reliance on endurance zones. Zone two is magic, no doubt, but it's not religion. Too much steady state training with no variation, it dulls the sharpness of your oxygen system. You get efficient, but not explosive. Your body forgets how to operate right on the limit, honestly. The best athletes, they polarize their training at around 80% easy, 20% very hard. Go listen to my chat with Professor Steven Seiler where we go deep on this one. It's the middle ground. That's the most common mistake I see riders making, spending too much time in that middle ground, that tempo comfort zone. 
it's really where fitness goes to plateau. Number seven is stress and hormonal interference. And this one often gets ignored or overlooked because high stress equals high cortisol. And high cortisol blocks recovery, blunts red blood cell production, and even suppresses testosterone. In short, stress suffocates your VO2 max. The fix isn't complicated. It's meditation, it's deep breathing, even a quiet walk in nature without your phone, it resets this system. You can't out-train poor physiology and stress is physiology. Lower it and your oxygen system wakes back up. When you align these seven levers, everything starts changing. Suddenly you're not wondering where your training feels stale. You're watching the data move again in the right direction. Your threshold creeps up, it feels good. You come home from a session and you recover faster. You feel powerful, even late in a ride. So to make this really actionable, because listening to something without implementation, it's not going to change anything. So here's the framework I've used with athletes and in my own training. First step, build that base. Commit to long aerobic work, the boring stuff. Two to three zone two rides every single week. Minimum 90 minutes. That's the foundation. That's the cost of entry here. Step two, it's add the stimulus. VO2 max grows in response to work. Include dedicated VO2 max sessions, at least one, preferably two a week. Four by four minutes at your VO2 max with equal recovery. It's a tough session, it's uncomfortable, but that's the point. Step three, prioritize recovery. Your body upgrades while you sleep, not while you train. Train gives the possibility to get stronger. Make sleep non-negotiable. Eight hours, it's not indulgent, it's essential. You know, I'm genuinely proud of my little man cave. My escape, my safe place. It's not glamorous by any means. It's crammed into the spare room in our apartment with bikes stacked in the corner, boxes everywhere, and the smell of chain lube is just kind of hanging in the air. But in that corner, that's where the work gets done. That's where I switch off from everything else and I lock in on my training. And the centerpiece of it all, it's the Wahoo Kicker Bike Pro. Honestly, it's the ultimate man cave bike. The thing just feels alive under you. It climbs, it descends, it shifts all automatically. You can dial into your exact position to the millimeter, just like your outdoor bike. And with the new setup, everything's smoother, quieter, and way more immersive. It's that perfect mix of comfort and performance that makes indoor cycling feel like a privilege, not like a punishment. And look, I'm Irish. I'm sitting in Ireland recording this right now. I know what it's like to wake up, look out the window, see wind, rain and sideways hail and think, do I really want to be out there today? And that's where the kicker comes in. You can get a world class session done right there in your safe little space, no matter what's happening outside. If you want to build your own version of that space, a place to train hard, stay consistent and escape for a little bit, Check out Wahoo at wahoofitness.com. They've got everything from the flagship Kicker Bike Pro to the Kicker Core 2, which gives you that same legendary ride feel at a killer price point. Wahoo, building the better athlete in all of us. Step four, fuel the machine. Eat like an athlete. Eat like someone who's trying to build an oxygen carrying capacity, not like someone who's dodging calories. Carbs for training, iron-rich foods for your blood, protein for repair. If your energy availability drops, your VO2 max will too. Step five, strength training and efficiency. Cyclists often skip the gym, but strength training trains movement economy. Two sessions a week focusing on posterior chain, core and stability. It can translate directly into oxygen efficiency on the bike. Step six, polarize intensity. Stay out of that gray zone I talked about. Easy means easy. Hard means hard. You'll get fitter faster and you'll avoid burnout. Step seven is manage stress and manage it like it's training. If your mind is fried, your physiology follows. Schedule downtime on your Google Calendar with the same discipline as you do intervals or meetings. A relaxed nervous system recovers faster, it adapts faster and it performs better. Put it all together and within six to eight weeks, you'll start seeing signs. Like I'd love for you to let me know in the comments when you're starting and come back in six to eight weeks and let me know how it went. You'll start to see heart rate stabilizing at high powers. You'll see less breathing strain, better endurance, faster recovery. And that's your oxygen system evolving. And it gets addictive because once you feel that improvement, you'll realize just how much potential was left sitting on the table dormant. There's something really powerful about realizing that your body is still adaptable. Even if you're watching this video and you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 
you can still create change. Your oxygen system doesn't retire. It responds to stimulus. And that's the beautiful thing. So don't let the number define you. Train the system. Sleep, recover, eat, stress less. Push harder when it's time to suffer. And watch as your body rewrites its own limits. If this episode resonated with you, please go watch my video on five fixable reasons your heart rate is high. It's the missing link between endurance and performance. Because when you understand both, you're no longer guessing, you're training, you're engineering progress. Thanks for tuning in. If you could do me two little favors, if you enjoyed this video, it would be amazing. If you could take a second to subscribe to the channel, because honestly, we're trying to upgrade our content all the time. And the more subscribers we get, the better the content we can bring you guys. And secondly, if you could share this with your riding buddies, that would mean the world to me, because I know the information in here has the ability to impact someone's trajectory. Thanks for tuning in, Roadman, and I will see you on the next one.